step forwards to my shadow. You are for love in my pattern. Hello and welcome to the ladies' room. Today it is my great pleasure to have with me Deborah Klugers who is a master beekeeper and the owner of Bonnick Bees. Um, you may remember Debbie from her show here, Keeping It Green, which was a wonderful <laughs> show on the environment. Thank and it's so great to have you. And now you're a master beekeeper. Right. How long did it take you to become a master beekeeper? Well, uh, it was a bit of a process. You had to have a good five years experience in a serious sideline in commercial beekeeping and uh, get kind of vetted into the program. Uh -huh. And uh, after that, <clears throat> it's a series of examinations. I had to take a lab exam, a written exam, a field exam, and an oral exam. My. Yeah, it was really uh, rough. And it, they give you five years to complete. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> I did uh, completed it last August. And I'm, I'm proud to be a Eastern Agricultural Society of North America Master Beekeeper. Yay! And how large is your area where you keep bees? I have honeybees from Montauk all the way to Stony Brook. So wow. it's about, about 100 miles, I think. Now, those different areas, are they like, would one of them be like a private person yeah, like absolutely. me, but yeah. you would be my beekeeper? Absolutely. And then do we share in the profits and stuff? No, How does no. that work? Actually, they're, <coughs> excuse me, they're, they're, it's your bees, it's your honey, it's your, it's your everything. And I'm your beekeeper, be kind of like a pet sitter. Uh -huh. uh, not that honeybees are pets, they're wild animals. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, that's, that's the basis, how, how I work. And I, I do work different ways. You know, I, I have some bees on a few uh, commercial um, properties to uh -huh. do some pollination, as well as education. So, um, you know, it's really important today. What got you interested in doing this? I was interested in honeybees actually through the Keeping It Green show. I had interviewed a farmer. He asked me to come over if I wanted to make some sauerkraut and spin some honey. So I had never heard, you know, I have a degree in environmental studies from Stony Brook University, and we did not learn anything about honeybees. And, you know, most of us have you know, a little idea that bees are important, yeah, you know, we, they do something the with news, our food. You know, if, if yeah. we don't have bees, we don't have food. Yeah, and so uh, the, the one, it was the Goodale Farm over in Riverhead, and the one question that I asked them that really piqued my interest was, um, did you notice a change in yield of your crops? And he said that they increased by about a third. And so that got me very interested, and I started keeping bees, and then, you know, through knowing different people around uh, our community, I started keeping bees for uh, private uh, property owners, and uh, the business has just taken off um, wow. since then. And you know, the the folks are doing a very good thing because honeybees are important not only for the the honey that they provide to us, but for the pollination. Um, honeybees, yeah. you know, we hear the talk of you know one out of every three bites of food is is uh, you can thank a honeybee for that, but more so um, they are very very important to our wildlife and habitat and food for our wildlife. Something we don't think about. Oh no, yeah. I, I never thought about that. Exactly. So because because the animals in the wild eat roots and plants and yeah, so berries, and they have you know, to be pollinated too. Exactly, to the trees for the birds to build their nest. You know, right. all it's Everything. it's all connected. So yeah, the bees yeah. are very important to that. Um, in addition, about 90 of our most uh, uh, loved food in, in the world is pollinated by honeybees. And even uh, if people eat meat, the, the, the farm animals need food in order Alpha to grow. Alpha. Exactly. So, I mean, it's, yeah. it's much bigger. And in America, it's a $20 billion contribution to the economy through honeybees. Honeybees provide that much of a, a monetary value to our, our food system, and we're just not really aware wow, of that. Yeah, that's it's huge. so interesting. No, I yeah. don't think anybody ever thinks yeah, about that. Yeah, $20 billion. Dollars. So now think about the global economy. Um, it's, you know, I'm not uh, well-versed on the global economy, but yeah, our, our local uh, U.S. economy is very important to have honeybees involved. Wow. So you've been doing it for five years. That's six years now, the business, yeah. How, where is your biggest area that you have bees? I you, um, lease land. I lease farmland up in Eastport. And uh, so I have about 30 colonies. I'll be increasing. I run about 80 uh, last year, and this year I'll be going up to 100 colonies. Oh my um, goodness, yeah. you must be running hither and yon. Well, all I'm a the commercial time. beekeeper and I actually wow. love what I do. So working to me is just I'm 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 blessed to be able to work with these animals. And yeah. I, I just want to tell you a little bit about honeybees because a lot of people um, uh, they're they're misunderstood. Honeybees are not aggressive. 
Um, honeybees are unlike wasps and hornets and yellow jackets, which, you know, come and bother you around your picnics and come yeah. after you sometimes. They actually come after you because they're aggressive. Honeybees are defensive, so they don't, you know, all that they want to do is gather nectar and pollen from flowers. And they actually, you know, as we talked about earlier, they are the reason that the flowers can reproduce. Right. You know, it's a little trick. The flower entices them in with the nectar and the honey in order for the flowers to reproduce. You know, so it's a nice... Uh, um, combination. So the flowers invite them in for the nectar and the right. honey? The honey's in the, the flowers? No, no, the nectar. The bees take the nectar and they bring it back to the colony. I thought the bees took the pollen. They also bring the pollen. So the pollen is their protein source yeah. and the nectar is their carbs for their energy. Um, the, the pollen is important for the new bees, the baby bees, to, to eat. If they don't get that that protein from the pollen their first few days of life, they won't be able to, uh, the glands in their bodies won't be able to be uh, uh, made. You know, so they, they, they must have the pollen in order to be able to have the glands that are necessary to make honey, to sting, you know, the sting gland. And now they, you know, the other, um, the other uh, physiological uh, aspects of their, their functioning is necessary to have the pollen. I notice you're calling them animals all the time, but yeah. they're insects. Um, they are animals. And then the insect is in the animal kingdom. Oh, yeah. Okay. So honeybees are our animals, yeah. <laughs> huh. What's the difference between a honeybee and a bumblebee? Um, they're uh, just different in their, their numbers of their, I mean, they're, they're just two different species, first of all. Bumblebees don't make honey, though? Bumblebees make a very, very small amount of honey. They only have about 500 to 1,000 members of their colony, whereas a honeybee colony can grow up to 60 or 70,000 members. You're so, kidding. No, so the, the honeybees make little, I mean, sorry, the bumblebees make these little pots, these yeah. little pots where they deposit their honey for their, um, for their babies that they make, whereas honeybees um, in our area could make you know, maybe maybe up to 100 pounds of honey, including the, the 60 or 70 pounds of honey that they need to make it through the winter. So the surplus or the extra honey, uh -huh. you know, beyond that 50 to 70 pounds that we leave on the hive um, for them to eat throughout the winter is what we would harvest. So, so what's the setup inside of a hive? There's the queen. Mm -hmm. And then there's like, what are the ones? Drones are the, the drones ones that are go, the males. And, mm -hmm. and do they go out of the hive or do they stay in the hive? Well, the drones have a very special place in the honeybee hive. What they do, uh, they have really one very important purpose. They mate with the queen from another colony and they die upon mating. So their entire life consists of hopefully one good hooking time. up one good time. <laughs> now that queen, she will mate with about 15 drones. So she's a little promiscuous. A day? Or? And, uh, well, she could go out to one to three mating flights. Usually it's one. Oh, she leaves. Uh, she'll, that, that's like the, just about the only time that you'll find a queen honeybee outside of the she's nest. She's outside yeah. like on well, the streets. Well, she's up in a drone congregation <laughs> area, just, you know, flaunting her short skirt. <laughs> You know, no skirts, no skirts. Um, but the males have never been observed gathering uh, pollen or nectar. Basically, they beg the females for food to be fed. Um, and in the winter time, the girls kick them out of the hive. It's kind of uh, interesting to watch. A little sad. They kind of drag. They don't kind of. They drag them out the front door and just throw them out. Um, and they die. They die because the only thing they would do in the winter time would be eat. And they, they they don't know how to keep the colony warm. You know, they they don't have really any function that we're aware of uh, other than mating with the queen. And the reason why the queen mates with so many males is for genetic diversity. So yeah. within a colony, there's one queen and all these uh, worker bees, the, the female bees, that do all of the work, very uh, varied fathers. So it, it brings a genetic diversity. So when I look into a colony, it's, it's beautiful. I'll see darker bees, lighter bees, you know, and it's just that they're, they're half sisters. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting. Wow. <laughs> Who would know all that? Yeah. Isn't nature so incredible? Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. So, the, so how do the, the female bees keep the hive warm just from they, buzzing uh, around? They uh, shiver, kind of like oh. penguins in a way. Like you know, where they, they, they cicadas they, that rub their legs together? Well, or? they detach their, uh, their wing muscles. They detach their wings, and they, they shiver their bodies to keep warm. And they stay in a cluster. Right now, today, it's about do 30 the degrees. Do the outer ones die, or no, they, they just keep turns. moving in like, yeah, they like take dolphins turns. when they swim? They keep moving No, in. they just kind of take turns, and they stay in a cluster, and they move within the colony. They move within the hive so to, to gather, the, you know, to eat the food that's been left for them. You know, so they'll move throughout and the winter. And who's left the food for them? Well, we uh, hopefully leave enough food for them to make it through the winter. So, so you take beekeeper. honey, but you leave honey. Right. And, and if, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things in nature that could happen. You know, we could have a drought. 
Um, we could have, uh, you know, a prolonged fall where, where there's just no resources. When the bees are active, when there's no food in the environment yeah. for them, there's no nectar for them to gather, they're, they're working off the resources that they, they saved all uh, summer long. So, you know, it might seem like a great thing to have a long fall or an early spring, but there's not the, the resources. It's a mismatch between the resources and what the animals yeah. need. So, um, you know, we, we can feed the bees. We could feed them sugar solution. We could feed them fondant, a pre-made, uh, or, may, you know, you could buy it or make it. So when you go, so when you go to Eastport, where you have mm -hmm. your largest area, how many hives do you have there? Well, um, I think I had about 25 but I'm going to increase it. We just planted 13 acres of a, a, a blend of clover, three different clovers. Nice. You know, so when the clover comes up in the spring, one thing that I would uh, recommend, if anyone could, just let those flowers go because that, yeah. that's the first, I well, do, the dandelions yeah. are the first food, one of the first foods. Uh -huh. You know, so when the bees are out in March and April, there's nothing much blooming, but the first foods are really, really important. And unfortunately, you know, we see these beautiful yellow flowers and we don't like them, but the, they are one of the, uh, you know. I like them. Yeah, they Dandelion are really beautiful. greens are really great they're in salads and stuff. They're delicious and beautiful, and they're, they're prolific. Yeah. So, I mean, it would be a great idea if we could just let those... Uh, Nature is totally set up to yeah. work, and human beings just yeah. can't screw it up enough. Yeah. Now, keep in so. mind, honeybees are not native to North America. They came from Asia, you know, about 50 million years ago. We brought them here, uh, huh. 1622, How did we get Virginia. food before then? How did we... How did we get food? How did things pollinate before well, we Well, we didn't bees? have 7 billion people to feed, first well, of all. <laughs> you know, so um, we there were native so bees. Honey. Yeah, there were native bees here in North America. When the, when, the, yeah. when the settlers brought them here, the Indians referred to them as the white man's fly. I mean, they were, they were just not native here. So we, we brought them, and we didn't bring them so much for the pollination. Bees weren't revered and, you know, uh, uh, brought everywhere because we didn't understand that relationship. Oh. We, didn't, we thought that they did gather honey, you know, in the way, way long ago. You know, we didn't understand how it all worked. Um, but it was the honey and, and the, the hive products, the wax and propolis and the, the pollen that the, the uh, you know, people 10,000, 20, 30,000 years ago, you know, it was about the honey. Honey is the only sweetener. So if we, if we don't take honey as a medicine and medicinal product, if we take it as a sweetener, um, it's the only sweetener that's not processed. Every other sweetener that we use, you know, is processed. And even right. white sugar, you know, is processed with cow bones. And, you know, it's just like an odd thing. So White honey, sugar is processed with cow bones? Yeah, that's another story. <laughs> that's Whoa. another show. You honey know, is the only food that never, ever goes bad. It never it goes bad. It could be hundreds bad. of years yes, old. thousands and it never, of years. never, ever goes yeah, bad. Yeah, and there's a whole chemical, uh, you know, explanation why. Um, but yeah, and it's uh, very healthy for you. I'm also a member of the American Apotherapy Society, and that's the use of high products in, in healing medicine, whether it's, you know, um, hair products or face products or you know, for wound healing, for, uh, you well, know. royal jelly they're always, like, touting for. Well, I'd be careful with the royal jelly. Um, it, it could come from uh, places such as China, and uh, China, we have banned the imports of Chinese honey. We have a very big problem in our country um, with uh, honey uh, adulteration. Adulterated. Exactly. And, yeah. um, you know, there's good reasons why we ban other countries' honey. They don't practice, uh, they, they use uh, chemicals that are, that are uh, harmful to the public. You know, they use antibiotics and, and things that could cause uh, disease and such. So, so they put antibiotics into the bees' food, mm -hmm. so yeah. the bees, bees don't die, but they die naturally anyway because they get kicked out in the winter? Well, I, it, I don't understand the use they of do antibiotics They do it prophylactically. Bees. They would, just like in our fa farm animals, you know, they just feed them antibiotics to, to thwart any possible infection. So, you know, using prophylactic uh, antibiotics just can't be good for anybody. So uh, we, we, we do not allow that. Um, you know, we have a food directive. We need a veterinarian now to come around to check our bees if we, we decide that they've got a disease that's treatable by an antibiotic. And there aren't many. You know, there are, you know we've got a European fowl brood, which isn't really an antibiotic uh, uh, need. And uh, basically, it would be um, another disease called nosema. You know, but uh, the, those tend to clear up on their own anyway. So there's really, I don't see a good reason to be pumping antibiotics into a, a honeybee hive. So if people see this show and they decide, oh, that might be fun to keep bees, mm -hmm. can you handle many more locations? I can handle many more locations, but what I would like to do is um, if people want to help the bees, you know, just to you know, go a little bit uh, backward on that question, 
we have a problem in this country. I was just at a conference down in South Carolina um, with the commercial beekeepers, and I am a commercial beekeeper, but not on the scale of some of these guys. I mean, I've got 100. They've got 10,000, 5,000, yeah, wow. you know, 2,000. You know, they've got big, big numbers of colonies. We have less honeybees in this country than we've ever had. Um, and around the 1950s, we had about 7 million colonies. Today, we have under 3 million colonies. Um, and so, how come? Well, we have a, you know, around the 50s, we had this new Greenland Revolution, which was a lot of pesticides were developed. And um, unfortunately, the amount of pesticides that we use in America is just increasing while other countries are banning certain, right. certain pesticides, right. like amount of clopperid, which is a systemic pesticide, is banned in other countries. And in America, we're just like, give us more. Um, the problem is only if you eat food or if you know anyone that eats food. It's the only reason why we should be concerned here. Um, it is a food security issue. Yeah. Um, we have an almond pollination event that happens each year in California. We, we have about um, a million acres of almond trees that need to get pollinated, and they must be pollinated by honeybees. Without honeybees, there would be no almonds. And almond industry is huge money. Um, for Gee, our, it also takes a ton of water to grow one yeah. almond. Oh, yeah, that, so that's that a problem, too. too. I wonder well, if maybe too. we should deal with less almonds. Well, th that said, we might not have a choice because yeah. we need about 2 million honeybee colonies uh, in about, mm, about a month. About 2 million of our honeybee colonies will be shipped over to California. We only have a little bit under 3 million, and there is a shortage wow. of honeybees. I was just at the conference, and these guys are suffering, and the bees are suffering. So um, just think, if all of the honeybees were in California, and some natural disaster or some terrorism a event, horrible fire, something yeah. happened yeah. in that most of our country's honeybees would die. Now, take that, you know, take that thought out of the equation. The honeybees are suffering due to the pesticides, as we discussed. Mm -hmm. We also have an uh, invasive mite that came from uh, China around 1987. It's called the Varroa destructor, and it's just like a tick. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a parasite, and it would be like a tick the size of a basketball on us. So it's this large uh, parasite that feeds on the liver, uh, the of fat the bodies honey. of the bees. It's, oh, and it's it must like love liver. them because they're so sweet. Well, you know, I, I guess, but uh, unfortunately, uh, it kills colonies outright. It gives them something called deformed wing virus, so these bees never have a oh. chance to fly. Their poor little wings oh. are deformed. They can't fly. But if it doesn't kill the colonies or the bees outright, it weakens them you know, like us. And how can you discover a thing like that? It's because even though on us it would be the size of a basketball, on yeah. a bee it would be Well, the, tiny, the, the mites were known, like to, known, they were actually on a different species of honeybees. Huh. So we have the Apis mellifera, which is the, the eastern honeybee here, um, but we had, I'm sorry, the western honeybee, and then we had, uh, so these mites were on uh, another species of uh, honeybees, another, another, uh, another species. So. Um, they accidentally were introduced to our country, and we just have seen the devastation uh, caused by it since 1987. So we have to, our, our, our challenge is to kill a bug on a bug, yeah. basically. And um, there is no new um, treatments available today. It will take about 8 to 10 years to bring something new to the market and millions and millions of dollars. So we're working as hard as we can. The problem with, you know, hard pesticides, so to speak, is that the mites become resistant. Just sure. like everything else. So, sure. so I use uh, three different acids. I, I use the hop acid derived from the hop plant. I used an acid that's naturally occurring in honey, formic acid. And then in the fall, I did a oxalic acid dribble. You know, and it's just, uh, it's very hard to try to keep these bees mite free. I gave away over 100 mite treatments to my fellow beekeepers because I'm not being nice or anything. I'm actually kind of selfish. If your colony is yeah. collapsing from this mite problem and my bees are going to take full advantage of that, they're going to come and rob you and they're going to take anything left. You're, you're collapsing and, then they and they it, catch it. it, it well, the mites are going to jump right on you, yeah. right on the bees that yeah. are doing the rob and bring. Now, I've already treated my colonies and I think, okay, I'm good. You know, I'm good for a certain amount of time until yeah. I need to treat again. So if I, if I think that, I'm, I'm going to fail because I need to test my bees for those mites. Um, so I'm, I'm giving away these mite treatments to, to get my fellow beekeepers to treat. There is, is no... It, is it like the treatment, is it like, is it a drip or is well, it the you dribble is, spray inside? The dribble, uh, the oxalic acid could be dripped. It could be uh, fu like uh, fumigated through. Uh -huh. um, and the, the formic acid is a pad and the, uh, the hop guard is, is kind of a, 
Mm, it's kind of like a liquid, but it's through contact. And there's thymol. There's a lot of organic treatments um, that we're using, and it's just not enough. I mean, we're, and for, for me, it's okay, but the commercial guys, they, yeah. they, you know, a lot of them are just, um, I don't want to say a lot of them, but a few that I've spoken to are done with the pollination because their bees just come back dying and dead from the, the pesticides. The thing is, oh. is that we test all of these um, pesticides, we'll, we'll test, say, a fungicide. The fungicide doesn't kill the bees. However, when you mix it with another, you know, you can give the bees 10,000 times the, the, the recommended dose that they would get in the farms of this fungicide, and nothing happens to them. But when you mix it with just a tiny amount of a different chemical that's widely used, it, it kills them immediately. And those kind of interactions are not being tested. So, you know, that's a problem. Not only are they not being tested, they're kind of going underground and sprouting somewhere else. Like Bayer, aspirin yeah. that you think is so benign, has now bought Monsanto. Yeah. And they're just changing the names of the chemicals. Uh, yeah, we've got a par problem with that Canberra in the Midwest where... Um, when they spray it, it, it kind of uh, it kind of forms like a cloud like and it, it's actually going miles away from the place where it was sprayed and it's killing um, you know the native landscape so it's it's non target species it's getting all these plants. The problem with that is all these plants that are important for the honeybees to live so with yeah. the improper nutrition the honeybees are suffering from we've got you know the mites we've got the pesticides um, we've got the climate change because remember I told you the mismatch between when the flowers are blooming and when the bees are yeah. able to fly. They can only fly with a certain temperature. So we've got a lot of um, problems. Um, with the, you know, if someone wanted to help the honeybees, um, it's, a, it's a pretty steep learning curve. I mean, years ago, you can get some bees, throw them in a box, visit them a few times a year. Everything was good. It was kind of easy to keep bees. It's not easy to keep bees anymore. You know, so I would suggest either that they you know, really do some, some learning um, taking classes, you know, going on the internet, going to conferences. I looked at your website. It was so interesting. And I saw your cat. You have a black cat. Yeah, yeah. I have two <laughs> black cats. Aww. And I think people, um, I think you said in the beginning of the show that the honeybees are not aggressive. No. So there's the cat right there. Yeah. And there's you. And you, they, you just have like a little hat on. Yeah. You don't have like, you think a beekeeper has to have this whole suit on. Sometimes like, it's recommended uh, that, that suit. yeah, like when you're harvesting the honey at certain times of the year, yeah. when they're filled with babies and filled with honey, you know, they're going to be a little bit more defensive. Yeah. But much of the time I'm in bare feet, you know, yeah, or flip flops. And yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, so, um, you know, my, my pets just kind of watch the bees. They, they like and they follow me around, you know, when mm. I'm, I'm in my own yard uh, keeping the bees. You know, but I wouldn't suggest anyone to go running up to beehives thinking, oh, they're, you know, it does take knowledge of their biology and, and their behavior. How much land do you need to have to keep um, bees? This much. <laughs> um, the thing is that honeybees travel two to five miles. Mm -hmm. You know, so you could plant a, you know, a whole bunch of uh, flowers on your property, but they're going to, so you know, they're going to go where they're going to go. They're they're, they wrong. have something called flower fidelity, where they're going to stick with the source. If they found a beautiful apple tree or, you know, something that was really providing a lot of uh, nectar and pollen yeah. to their, their colony, yeah. they'll stick with that until it's done. Huh. You know, I just um, wanted to say, so if anybody wanted to help the honeybees more, um, plant flowers. You yeah. know, just plant flowers. And I, I have a, a, something that I wrote that talks about, you know, planting flowers from February all the way through the fall. And especially like around August, where there, there's not, you would, you know, it sounds counterintuitive, but there's not a lot blooming in August. And that's when the bees start the robbing and, you know, uh -huh. they're, they're uh, you know, they So, what kind hungry. of flowers can you plant in August that I, you would I, need to you would yeah, need I would say in check out that. In August? Yeah, I would say check out, check out that, uh, the paper that I wrote or, or look online because depending on where people live and what their property can handle, uh -huh. there, there'd be a variety of uh, different things. And is it a. a does it cost a lot of money to set up a, a bee? You always see, like it in Winnie the Pooh, you see the hive as yeah. this thing. Well, that's a skep. But now they're like yeah. slatted like, yeah. boxes. So that skep is illegal to use in America because basically you have to kill or destroy the colony in order to harvest the honey. We developed here around 1850 a Reverend Langstroth. Uh, yeah. I think it was from Pennsylvania, and we've been using the same Langstroth hive ever since. So yeah, it's got the frames. There's a few different types of mm -hmm. movable, movable frames is, is what you want, that you can remove the frames without destroying and the colony. And then does the honey just drip out? How no. do you get the honey out? So the honeybees, they, they bring back the nectar, yeah. and then they pass it off to their sister, who passes it off to her sister, and on and on it goes, and they add enzymes. And then when it's ripened, 
or, or when it's ready to be deposited into the cell, they deposit it into the cell and then it ripens. Um, and then when that, uh, the moisture content has to be reduced to about 18%. So nectar could be 75% water and the bees reduce the moisture, they cap it yeah. and then it, with wax. So it's not going anywhere. It's, it's ready to go. And this would, be, this would be what you would see within the hive. This is called cut comb honey. So they cap it with wax. Huh. And so you make candles, beautiful make candles, candles, and Thank they burn you. a lot slower and cleaner, right? Yeah, like they burn they... Uh, cleaner, brighter, longer than soy or paraffin, and they uh, are renewable. They come from a natural source. They smell like, uh, honey. like honey because they're made from honey. So it takes about eight pounds of honey to make one pound of wax. That's like, is that one of your prize-winning candles? Um, I entered this into a, a honey show. I forget which, which place it won. But just so that people know, in order to know that you're really getting beeswax, you can get um, beeswax on the market, and it would say beeswax candles. This is 100% pure beeswax. Um, uh, other folks, they could say beeswax, but it would only have to contain 51%. But to know that you have um, pure beeswax, beeswax develops a bloom, and it's this whitish. Uh -huh. And you see, if you don't like the white, you know, you can just rub it off with yeah. a nylon or a cloth or something like that. But that's just so that you know what you're getting. Just like honey being adulterated and laundered, um, beeswax products are unfortunately also... Um, you know, sometimes not, uh, you're not getting what you think you're getting. So Bonac B, honey, <laughs> we can find it in all our local markets and a it's couple? from our neighborhood. Yeah, and actually, honey. And I did a pond. Not adulterated. Not adulterated. And pure, actually, pure, pure. I had it tested for, uh, I did a, a 400 panel pesticide analysis in addition to a glyphos glyphosate, which is what's in uh, Roundup. Yeah. And my honey came back with no pesticides in it, pure. which is unusual for uh, today. Yeah. Well, we could talk about yeah. this forever. <laughs> you know. And I hope you come back. Thank you, Judy. And I want to find out about keeping bees. I have two Good. cats and a dog, but. <laughs> They'd probably be so interested. Put little outfits on yeah, them. Yeah, <laughs> put little outfits on them. And so, everybody, look at Deb's website. It's amazing. It's so interesting. And thank you for joining us in the ladies' room. And remember, ladies, give yourself lots of room. Room for love, room for fun, room to grow, and room to glow. And this will make you glow. Yeah. <laughs> you can, uh, if you get a cut and you pour it on the cut, yeah. it will heal right away. It's magic. <laughs> yeah, it is magic stuff. Just nature's elixir. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Thank you so Thank much, you Judy. Thank you so much. Nice. Breathe in. Stop.